Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this GSW and Global Health Advocates joint event, African Union, European Union, Cooperation on Global Health Research and Innovation, Successes, Challenges and Opportunities. Before we start, please see the Mentimeter link in the chat and let us know from where in the world you are joining us today. This way we can already try out this tool that we'll be using also again later today for you to share your opinions and comments with us. My name is Lisa Görlitz and I'm the head of the Brussels office at Deutsche Stiftung Weltbevölkerung, DSW, where we work on EU-Africa relations, advocating for a healthy and sustainable future, free from poverty-related and neglected diseases, thanks to advances in global health research and innovation, and a future with universal access to sexual and reproductive health and rights. First, I would like to introduce a few housekeeping rules, as um, we always do for these online events. This event has simultaneous interpretation in English and French. You can find the audio options at the bottom of your Zoom screen, the little globe icon, and you can select your preferred language. You can also click more and view subtitles if you wish to use the automated captioning feature. Please be aware that this event is recorded um, and will be live streamed on DSW's YouTube channel, where you'll be able to rewatch it afterwards. Our first panel will outline the policy priorities of AU-EU cooperation and their expectations for the summit, followed by a short 15 minutes Q&A session. We will then, in the second part of the event, discuss the successes, challenges and opportunities of AU-EU cooperation on global health research and innovation with a number of experts who are joining us today. We will conclude the event with another Q&A session to ensure a lively debate and to benefit from the wealth of voices and expertise gathered here today. You can post your questions at any time in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom console, and we will address them as the conversation unfolds. Please keep your questions short and topical. Tell us who you are and ideally also whom you would like to address your question to. Why don't we have a look already uh, to see where you're all joining from, if you already had the chance to answer the first question of our Mentimeter. If you haven't had the chance, do it now. I see already a few locations popping up. Mm -hmm. I did not expect to see Australia on the map. <laughs> this is fantastic. Okay, you can continue clicking um, through the Mentimeter and share your ideas and comments and your opinions. Um, so we can hopefully take that into account for the second part of the discussion. Let me now invite my co-host, Patrick Bertrand, the director and founder of Global Health Advocates to take the floor and give the opening remarks. Patrick, over to you. Thank you, Lisa, and, and, wel and welcome to everybody. I'm very happy to be here with you. And I'm switching now to French for our francophone audience. Uh, bonjour à toutes et à tous. Uh, Hello, everyone. I am Patrick Bertrand, the director and, uh, of Global Health Advocates. Our NGO lobbies French institutions and the European Union to have better policies and to have the necessary resources to fight global health inequalities. We are very happy together with DSW to organize this conference on the eve of a very important moment that we are talking about for quite some time, the sixth African Union, European Union Summit, which aims to lay the foundations for a new partnership between the two continents. This summit is a unique opportunity for African and European leaders to show solidarity and common political will to end inequalities in access to tools to fight COVID-19, but also to respond to historical epidemics such as HIV, tuberculosis and malaria. As you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has once again shed some light on the failures of health and research and development policies to ensure equitable access to health innovations and products. Health inequalities have sadly, are sadly not new, and history is repeating itself. Nearly 30 years ago, uh, 
millions of lives were lost to HIV because of a lack of political will to provide universal access to antiretroviral treatment, which is not new, unfortunately. We have already lost too much time and too many lives. It is urgent that European and African leaders take ambitious steps and make financial commitments to strengthen both African health system and the continent's capacity to research, develop and produce health products. R&D efforts must address the needs of African societies, including the need to develop health products to diagnose, prevent and treat poverty related and neglected diseases. This week's summit to truly launch a renewed partnership, a real partnership, the European Union must translate its rhetoric into action so that health products are truly common goods. The UA must support financially the agenda of the African Union to support health product innovations and to have sovereignty. The European Union is expected to launch barriers to intellectual property rights and to encourage pharmaceutical companies to transfer the technologies and the know-how needed to strengthen African capacities. The goals will not be met unless investment in R&D in Africa is increased and conditional on guarantees that the research will result in affordable health innovations adapted to the needs of population. Let's not forget the access for populations. We are delighted today to welcome policymakers and experts from both continents to hear their perspectives and to learn more about the initiatives in place to strengthen cooperation between the African and European unions on research development and access to health innovations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, I will now switch back to English. My pleasure now to turn to our first panel. Franz, who is currently chairing the Council of the European Union, has announced its ambition to strengthen the EU's international dimension of research and innovation. And global health also features prominently in France's presidency program. We were actually very happy to see um, that last week during a joint meeting of EU health and foreign ministers in Lyon, the French presidency committed to continue preparing the revisions of the European global health strategy together with member states, which is something that civil society has been asking for for a long time. I'm delighted to introduce Monsieur Frédéric Depetri, Deputy Head of Division of Human Development at the French Ministry of Europe and Foreign Affairs, who will talk about the priorities of the French presidency in global health research and innovation and his expectations and hopes for tomorrow's summit. Monsieur Depetri, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elisa. Uh, I will express myself in, in French. Et, et bonjour et, et merci, Patrick, pour, pour cette introduction. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you very much for this introduction. So this UAUE summit at the end of the week is a unique opportunity to show that the EU is the first partnership with Africa when it comes to vaccine solidarity, but more um, generally in terms of research on health products. I want to go back on the minister conference that happened on the 9th of February, since Lisa just mentioned it. This conference allowed to start a reflection on strategic topics to have a consensus on the need to strengthen and to review the European strategy when it comes to global health, on the need to mobilize, uh, to start the multilateral reform, and in particular, the WHO, which is the legitimate body to do that. This allowed us to also strengthen our European leadership in response to the pandemic and to highlight the value when it comes to health. So the organization of this summit at the end of the week will allow us to dig deeper on these topics and to move on with the partnership between both continents and specifically on the access to health product and the capacities on manufacturing, local manufacturing, and 
commitments that are, we hope, ambitious. What France is promoting as president of the council is to have a common approach and a coordinated approach globally, which is essential to give access to safe, affordable and quality products. France is determined that the EU commits in this direction, which is a multilateral direction and at the core of the value of solidarity and justice that are those of the EU. The French government is a strong um, advocate for vaccines in the fight against COVID-19, but also of strengthening the local manufacturing capacities. COVAX uh, wasn't able uh, to deliver to our Southern uh, partners, which is what we highlighted. Uh, this has also created uh, a movement for other countries to do so, and this has accelerated vaccination campaigns. But this is not a structural long-term answer. The goal promoted by France and its European partners is to uh, foster the access to health sovereignty in Africa. And what our partners wish is to be better prepared to face other sanitary crises. This is essential to reach the objective of um, universal health coverage. Africa import 90% of its uh, health products. And what we hope, thanks to the Team Europe initiative, with Math Plus in it, uh, project is to meet the needs expressed by our African partners to foster uh, the development of production units in Africa. So first we need to transfer technologies in Africa. And this was done by the WHO recently in South Africa. This is a success, even though this come after months of waiting. This will allow the production of vaccines thanks to an integrated approach. Uh, France is participating on uh, 20 million euros with the Commission, Germany and other partners. Soon, production units everywhere in the world will receive the know-how of technologies for uh, ARN messenger technologies, and we will move forward with this during the summit, especially in Africa. New production units will be created. France uh, works with the Pasteur Institute in Dakar, with Germany and Belgium, to create a regional pool in West Africa to create vaccine, but also other health products above uh, yellow fever vaccines, which are already happening in Dakar. The goal of Europe is not to offer a short-term vision, but we want to promote a global access to vaccine, but also for prevention and diagnosis uh, on COVID-19 and other diseases. We know that a perennial uh, solution will not be possible without transferring technologies. And we know that we also need a legal framework and we need also trained professionals. And we count on the Academy of the WHO that was created in Lyon to be one of the factor to train um, professionals everywhere in the world and especially in Africa. We also support um, other institutes for pharmaceutical access. We see that monopiravir and Paxlovid are retroviral treatments that are working. France wants that industry um, works in order to transfer this technology. I am thrilled of these perspectives of cooperation to strengthen health systems in Africa. And I hope this will be strengthened again in the summit UAUE. France with the European Union is 
uh, sensitive to strengthen the framework, the legal framework, and we want to harmonize in Africa, thanks to the AMA, the African Medicine Agency, with which we want to have a collaboration with the European Medicine Agencies. And this regul uh, regulatory harmonization is needed to develop a medicine market and ensure that products are safe and of good quality in the continent. We also work with African partners in a more global framework to be better prepared against pandemics and to create resilience. And this is a, a major preoccupation for global health. I'm thinking of um, Team Europe initiative on sanitary uh, security in Africa with five pillars, with one dedicated to research and the fight against microbial resistance. I will also mention a few projects that matters to us. The FSPI project developed by the Pasteur Institute to create a network for prevention and monitoring on micro uh, resistance, microbial resistance in Africa. Another project that works on neglected tropical disease, in particular Ebola. Uh, the project Prezod also uh, aiming at strengthening cooperation when it comes to a new diseases emergence with a pilot phase that will start in the first quarter of 2022 in four African countries, also in Cambodia, to expand monitoring networks when it comes to diseases. The Medilab Secure project that um, aims at uh, bettering um, uh, the monitoring and an AFD project with 10 million euros to foster the monitoring of uh, emergence of new variant of COVID-19. So very concrete projects are happening that we are hoping to develop to fight the COVID-19 pandemic, but more globally for a renewed partnership when it comes to global health. And during the crisis, France has not lowered its commitments. I'm thinking of uh, the HIV, tuberculosis and malaria fund. We have maintained our uh, financing and we need to maintain this fund we maintain our commitment and against a tropical neglected diseases. France is also um, a fervent advocate for a, an approach with the continent, the African continent. And this is the message of French presidency uh, during the next summit. Thank you very much, Monsieur Deputy. It was very encouraging to hear sectors, the key sectors you mentioned, such as regulatory harmonization and in particular support to the African Medicines Agency, the One Health approach, AMR, um, but also to hear that the fight against poverty-related and neglected diseases remains a priority for France. Before we turn to our next speaker, I would uh, like to warmly invite everybody again to participate in the Mentimeter. The link should be included um, in the chat. I see some uh, conversation in the chat and just to confirm if uh, are we maybe switching speakers. We go ahead as planned. Um, so the African Union has a new commissioner for education, science, technology, and innovation. And they come to the summit with a renewed impetus on matters of health and research and innovation, including the acceleration of vaccination against COVID-19, 
And we are really eager to hear about the African Union priorities for the summit and what challenges and opportunities you see in the current AU-EU cooperation framework for global health research and innovation. And I would really like to extend my gratitude to Mr. Hambani Mascellini, Acting Head of Science and Technology and Innovation at the AU Commission for joining us today, despite the incredibly busy agenda of this day. And um, apparently we learned earlier today, you're joining us from your twin agency. <laughs> so uh, from DGRTD today, over to you. And thank you so much for making the time today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. And thank you, Patrick, for the opening, as well as the representative from France, who has outlined an agenda that dovetails to the expectations of the African Union as well. I think the coronavirus outbreak crisis that affected all of us in the world is a strong reminder that we should cooperate collaborate and ensure that research and innovation readily provide rapid responses, bringing science to the service of the people. As I speak now, we find out that 10% of the African population is vaccinated, but the word here is only 10%. If we maintain that kind of a scenario, we are not creating a better world for us. We wouldn't want Africa to be the center for new variants of COVID because the whole world will not be at rest. We will not have done justice to humanity and will not have answered the call of science without borders. That's why I'm saying the French uh, representative has out, actually outlined what we expect to see in the global health. We cannot live with a situation where Africa imports 90% of the health products. Africa is a destination of choice, a partner of choice for Europe. And our hope is that we can establish global vaccine manufacturing centers in Africa to enable access and distribution of vaccines so that instead of me saying it's 10% and only 10% of it will be saying Africa is vaccinated and will be running this whole world together. So the issues of technology transfer and strong collaboration stand strong in our cooperation. And that is what we expect to see. The vast majority of mortality caused by diseases in Africa, whether communicable or non-communicable, are preventable if we build a strong integrated research and development ecosystems in the African con continent in collaboration with our partners. If we build Africa's public health systems and institutions to effectively, effectively respond to the disease burden. African global health has gained special attention as you have heard from the previous speakers. There is a strong agenda to have a clear legal framework of cooperation that enables us to have access to technologies, manufacturing, distribution of medicines in Africa. In terms of research and development, we have set out a science, technology, and innovation agenda. We have set out the long-term agenda 2063, and we do have the global sustainable development goals. So what exactly stops us from having a concrete, productive, result-oriented partnership, result-oriented, focus on global health to ensure that the citizens' well-being is taken care of, affordable health, universal health. We outlined in our strategy 
key intervention areas that we think we should ensure that Africa has. The first is to build science, technology, and innovation capacities in Africa so that we have centers of excellence that support research and development. We improve science, technology, and innovation competencies. We increase the critical mass of researchers on the continent compared to what we have now. We improve infrastructures, facilities, laboratories, etc. We improve policy environment and regulatory frameworks. We promote innovations and entrepreneurship. And innovations have played a critical role during this COVID uh, period in education, in health, in commerce. And Africa has not been spared. They've innovated. But still, we need much more to learn from each other through global partnerships to ensure that we achieve more on the efforts that are taking place on the ground. The same strategy of the African Union sets out priorities for which the African global health is among them, where we want to foster health uh, research and innovation, research and development on health, on prevention, on control, and ensure universal health and the well being of the African people. It lays the emphasis on areas that are not necessarily health per se, but contribute to health and the well being. For example, we also need to ensure that other sectors such as food and nutrition and sustainable agriculture are up and running and supporting what we are doing in the global health through research and innovation. Water, sanitation, and climate change are among the areas that we should also focus to ensure that the efforts we are making in health are protected and stand the test of the day. AU-EU cooperation. We are at the summit of heads of state and government. And we've been doing quite a lot within this cooperation, but much more has to be done, which is well-structured, which is well-funded and also result-oriented. For example, we, within our cooperation, we, we launched an African research grant program to support collaborative research in Africa where African institutions collaborate among themselves, but also bringing in African and researchers from Europe to work together. It's a small program that we started with 35 million euro, but the impact has been huge. We created 185 networks on research, of, on, of research in the continent. And this could be easily expanded if we work together in a faithful collaboration, a collaborative environment. Within this cooperation, we also established the AU-EU high-level policy dialogue. And our aim here has been to bring Africa and Europe together in terms of research and development so that we have a common understanding and mutual on mutual and common problems so that we can work together and we can dialogue together. In 2020, we convened, in the face of the pandemic, we convened a ministerial high-level policy dialogue, and it adopted four priority areas for science and technology to respond to COVID. And public health is one of them. Now, moving on capacities on the continent, the commission through its various departments, particularly led by the Department of Health, humanitarian affairs and social development has been advocating for the establishment of key responsive continental institutions to our public health, as well as to cooperate with the world and contribute to the efforts that we are globally doing in the health sector. We established the Africa CDC, which you all know has been in the forefront fighting Ebola and now the COVID-19 assisting member states to build their response capacities for these uh, tragic uh, calamities. Furthermore, the Africa CDC continues to expand 
its role on the continent, as well as fostering research and innovation on health. So far, we have developed uh, priorities for COVID-19 in Africa. We are advocating for vaccine manufacturing and broader distribution through this institution. And it needs to be supported so that we achieve that African global health, so that Africa doesn't become the breeding ground for new variants that will really cause the world restlessness. The second institution that is coming up is the African Medicines Agents, AMA, which we hope will find a number of cooperative organization to ensure it to function because like the previous speaker, like Patrick has said, it's too late. We should have done this years ago so that we maintain global health that is fit for all of us. I'm now speaking from here in Europe and I should be safe. Otherwise I will be a problem to all of you. This, this armor is a huge milestone in harmonization and regulation of African pharmaceutical landscape across the continent and the efforts to improve weak regulatory systems of member states so that we have access to quality pharmaceutical products on the continent. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much, Mr. Shalini. It's really appreciated and we wish you all the best for this exciting summit week and that the rain will not be too harsh to process rain for you coming from Addis. Um, unfortunately, we are running a little bit late, which means that um, Director Russo, the, the Director of uh, Global Approach and International Cooperation Research Innovation at the European Commission, uh, Director General for Research and Innovation had to leave us today, but thankfully, one of her colleagues from DGRTD uh, has kindly agreed to, to fill in and be our third and last speaker of the first panel. Before I hand over to Jens Högel, let me just remind you again of the Mentimeter because I'm really curious to hear your opinions on the survey that we put together. Dear Jens, handing over to you, I hope this works. Yes, just unmuted my microphone. So thank you very much for giving me the floor. Uh, thank you, thank you again also to the audience for joining this um, this uh, important uh, meeting today, and also to the colleagues, um, to the many colleagues uh, who have joined also uh, together with uh, TGRTD and my director, who apologizes for not being able to to stay within uh, to stay for the meeting, but she has other. Uh, how would you say, competing priorities, <laughs> as usual. Um, this, is, this is the fate of, uh, of, our, uh, of our hierarchy. Um, so let me, let me start by saying that, um, uh, of course, we say that the coronavirus pandemic really showed the entire world the key role of research and innovation for providing innovative solutions to combat this particular disease, but also other diseases. And we are very proud, of course, as, as Europeans, if you allow me to say, that um, one of the key players that has uh, entered the market with a, with a vaccine is coming from Europe. Um, that shows also the, the strengths of Europe in terms of research and innovation. But you also know that international col collaboration um, results in more and quicker benefits for our societies. And this is why the European Union in its global approach to research and innovation reaffir reaffirms its commitment to cooperate with the best scientists in the world, to be produce the best science and to turn ideas into viable innovations. Let me briefly mention in this regard three key multilateral in initiatives uh, where the EU is participating, illustrating the importance the EU, we all on our side, attach to the global health approach. That is firstly, the International Rare Disease Research Consortium. Secondly, the International Consortium for Personalized Medicine. 
And I think during this, uh, this week, uh, there will be also uh, a talk about personalized medicine. And thirdly, and most importantly, probably the global health joint undertaking, the European and developing countries clinical trials partnership in its third edition. And it is definitely the most successful and the, the, the most appreciated collaboration between European Union, European Union member states and African Union member states. And it has created some tangible outputs already, uh, or very remarkable tangible outputs, I should say. So our commitment for health research still goes much further. And you can count on the EU to continue engaging at global level to combat our breakouts like the coronavirus diseases, disease, sorry, and others, but also to work on the preparedness for future uh, uh, outbreaks. In order to do so, of course, we consider innovation to be the key. It will boost the recovery of our economies in the EU, not only, of course, with regard to, uh, to um, providing better health, uh, better conditions for addressing health concerns, but has also an important role to play at the international level, of course. Um, for this reason, Commissioner Gabriel and the previous uh, EU Commissioner Akbor invited us at the uh, ministerial meeting in 2020, the Research and Innovation Ministerial meeting to which uh, Mr. Barney already referred to, to look into stepping up cooperation in the field of innovation and agree and agreed on developing a joint EU EU innovation agenda, EU EU innovation agenda. Now we we are hoping, of course, that during this summit, by the end of this week, the state leaders of the summit um, will acknowledge the importance of the ongoing work in developing this innovation agenda for building knowledge economies and to integrate research and innovation as an indispensable pillar for sustainable economic development and job creation. And I'm always surprised research and innovation, personally, I'm always surprised that research and innovation is always seen as the sister of sustainable development, but not directly as the initiator of sustainable development. So we, I think we should also spend some time thinking about this. For the, for the innovation agenda, the AOEU innovation agenda, we launched a public consultation on the 14th of February, this Monday, and we count on all stakeholders to provide their constructive feedback for making the innovation agenda even more impactful. Um, and impactful also in the sense of, we will use this innovation agenda to translate research and innovation outcomes into viable commercial solutions, addressing common challenges such as infectious diseases, of course. Now, this is one of the main aims of the innovation agenda to speed up this transla translation process or translatory process from good ideas into innovation. Under the uh, EU EU innovation agenda, a tool is for this reason under development that would allow to promote highly successful research and innovation project outcomes for making the next step, bringing their intentions or their inventions, sorry, to fruition. This tool will be built on economic and financial assessments, of course. Um, so it's a bit of a foresight, uh, a foresight exercise as well that, that will uh, be conducted. Uh, it will build on joint actions with financial institutions and venture capitals, as well as it should raise the skills of young entrepreneurs and innovators regarding business know-how and market intelligence. So I think what is really needed, and this is uh, what, we are, uh, what we are talking about when, when it comes to the innovation agenda, we will try and provide, a, uh, a, um, how can I say, a complete package that would allow us really to use more and more actively use research and innovation outcomes for sustainable development in addressing societal challenges. First steps have already been taken in this regard, and we will continue working hard to provide what you can maybe call the missing link between a current research and innovation project outcomes and market uptake of those achievements made by scientists and researchers. Finally, of course, 
I would like to inform you that we are considering also a global innovation platform in which the best incubators and uh, startups from Europe and the world can meet and exchange ideas and come up with innovative and sustainable solutions. Again, uh, underlining, underlining the, the importance we attach to international or multilateral cooperation. Consideration for this global innovation platform initiative are part of the global gateway strategy presented last December by the European Commission and the European External Action Service. And uh, in this communication, uh, uh, the principles for major European investments around the world are set out. So thank you very much. Uh, with these words, I would like to close my intervention and I hope uh, I, I, I will, or we will hear your voice and listen uh, and, can, and will be able to, to read your contributions to our uh, public online consultation about the innovation agenda and uh, wish you um, a successful end of the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Hugel, for speaking on behalf of uh, Director Russo, and please convey our apologies for the timing. I couldn't agree more, of course, that EDCGP is a role model of equal partnership that delivers concrete results, and we definitely share your hopes that the heads of states and government um, in this summit this week will acknowledge that research and innovation are not only a sister, but a precondition of sustainable development. Um, Mr. Marcellini had to also uh, leave us, but I just wanted to highlight uh, a few important elements that he mentioned, the need for both a strong research and development ecosystem and public health system in Africa. He mentioned the importance of uh, facilitating tech transfer and the need for concrete result-oriented partnership to realize the African Union Science, Technology and Innovation Agenda, the SDGs and Agenda 2063. Mm, we are running, unfortunately, a little bit late. So I'm just checking if there's maybe one question from the audience that uh, to our, to either Jens or Monsieur Depetri who are still with us, and also, please don't hesitate to share your comments via the Mentimeter survey. Okay, so it appears there are no questions from the audience at this stage, which, but I think we are uh, lucky to have also um, our speaker still with us until the end of the session, so we can um, hopefully include them in the Q&A and exchange session at uh, the end of the second panel. So from our dear representatives of the African Union Commission, the European Union Commission and the French presidency, we have heard about the priorities and initiatives that both the EU and AU Commission plan to implement in the next few years and about the views of the French government in the field of Africa-EU relations on research and innovation. We now move to the second part of our event in which an excellent panel of experts will help us to address the three following questions. First, what are the greatest successes of EU-Africa global health research and innovation collaboration? What are the main challenges? And third, what are the opportunities and maybe also lessons learned that you see in EU-AO cooperation in this field? I now have the pleasure to introduce our five expert panelists and um, I will challenge our, uh, our panelists to, to keep their answers uh, short so we can have a, a lively debate afterwards with the audience. Joining us from Paris today, I believe our first speaker is Professor Yastan, Yastan Panat, the director of the French Emerging Infectious Disease Agency and the current chair of the EDCTP uh, board, as well as a member of the Scientific Council for COVID-19 of French President Emmanuel Macron. Welcome, Yastan. Joining us from Nairobi today is Dr. Marlene Timmerman, a medical doctor, researcher, and former senator 
She is the director of the Center of Excellence in Women and Child Health at the Aga Khan University in Kenya. She is a member of the EDCTP Scientific Advisory Committee and a member of the Africa U Advisory Group on Research and Innovation Cooperation, advising on health issues. Marlene has authored a recent policy paper focused on EU Africa cooperation on health research, which I believe um, will soon be available. Joining us from Geneva today, Robert Matirou is the director of programs at UNITAID, where he is responsible for planning, developing, and implementing a complex portfolio of health product innovation investments. Before joining UNITAID in 2012, he served as head of operations and vaccine development for the World Health Organization's H1N1 pandemic response and as chief operating officer of the Global TB drug facility. Then we have another speaker from Nairobi, Ethel Makili, is the Associate Director for Advocacy Policy and Communications at Ayavi. She's responsible for designing and implementing advocacy initiatives aimed at enhancing environment for global health research and development. She leads communication initiatives related to Ayavi's Africa region programs. And last but not least, joining us also from Geneva, I believe, Dr. Stéphane Duparc is the Chief Medical Officer for the Medicines for Malaria Venture, where he leads the medical team and is responsible for all the medical aspects of ongoing studies in MMV, in particular for the safety of drugs developed by MMV. Prior to joining MMV in 2007, Stefan was the Director for R&D for Antimalarial Drugs at JSK. Thank you so much to this amazing panel for being here with us today. First, I would like to ask all speakers to share a success story with us. What is, in your view, a positive example of eu au collaboration on global health research and innovation? Where have you seen impact and synergies? I challenge you to keep your answer to one minute. And I would like to ask Yastan first. Yes, done over to you. Thanks a lot, and, and, and thanks for, merci beaucoup pour votre uh, invitation. So Thank you to... very much for your invite. I will be speaking in English. Yeah, so I think that the, certainly the success story on Europe Africa partnership, for me, one of the biggest success stories is, of course, the EDCTP program which is a public public partnerships between 16 African countries and 14 European countries that was launched in 2003, renewed in 2014, and was just renewed uh, uh, this year with the EDCTP3. It's the focal point of EU support for global health research. And we heard this morning how this is important. Uh, and it's uh, uh, really a global health research and development in Africa and a visible sign of commitment to the sustainable development goals. Um, uh, so basically, uh, uh, for example, between 2014 and 2021, uh, 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 more than eight hours, 800 million uh, euros uh, were used to fund projects through EDCTPs. It's a huge program on tuberculosis, malaria, HIV, emerging diseases, neglected infectious diseases, diarrheal diseases, low respiratory tract infection. So it was in the beginning mostly uh, on HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria, and now it's going further. And of course, France has a very important role within this, with a total of 50 countries uh, collaboration in EDCTP for France. And just one word, and I'll finish, and I think it's important to say that the Global Health EDCTP3 uh, program that was just launched is a huge program, even more uh, ambitious to try to focus on the unmet medical needs, specifically of vulnerable population, infectious diseases, and at with Africa with more inclusive global collaboration. So this is a real, I think, success story. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Lisa.
thanks to you. And yeah, I think it's no secret that um, <laughs> I would fully agree about uh, EDCTP being the, the greatest success story. Marlene, can I hand over to you? Yes, sure. But um, I'm afraid that I had the same message <laughs> as Yazdan. I've been involved in EDCTP since the very beginning. And in research for the last 30 years and more than half in Africa. So I've seen the evolution of BDCTP, the sector of excellence, and the capacity building. I'm not going to repeat all this. BDCTP is really a great, great example. And I'm going to, at the same time, and I'm not coming back then in the next two or three rounds, uh, because time, the big challenge, I think, is the translation of all this great research and the findings, not only for EDCTP, but everywhere. You have a publication, you have a finding. How do you translate this into public health? This is a big, big challenge. So all of us, we are happy that EDCTP is now going from the vertical HIV malaria tuberculosis programs where we have really reached uh, a lot going to into global health. But still, having said that, the challenge will be not only for the CTP, all of us, how do we do with finds? We have great innovations, great systems, and for the we, we have to improve public health. And it's still the same message as we had with Health for All in 1978 and Alma Ata. We repeated in the MDGs in the SDGs and we make progress, but too slow. So I think a big challenge, but at the same time, we have an opportunity now uh, learning from the pandemic, how can we bring digitalization, innovation, artificial intelligence, and a lot of new things in drug development, therapeutics, and so on. How can we bring it to the people? Because I work on the ground and we are still struggling with really basic things like women dying because of uh, 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 no access to blood transfusion because of anemia, issues that have been already 30 years. And despite everything, and despite all the innovations, we don't manage really to translate it into the reality. We have the Abuja declaration that every country would uh, allocate and commit 15% of the budget. We are not there. So yes, we made progress. Yes, we have challenges, great opportunities, but the major challenge is really translated to policies and practices and to find finance and commitments. I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Marlene. Yeah, it is of course uh, frustrating to uh, <laughs> to see that we are still calling for the same things that uh, were called for even decades ago. And I think, yeah, the one main message I also heard from you, sustainable financing of these initiatives is needed. Let me turn to Robert. What is your greatest success story? Great, thank you very much uh, for having Unitaid on this uh, important webinar today. In fact, I'm not speaking from Geneva, I'm speaking from South Africa where we are here having very important engagements with the government and other leading institutions. So it's very timely and appropriate. Let me cite three examples of successes um, in the context of Unitaid's work um, as it relates to the EU, as it relates to the African Union and, and key countries on the continent uh, in Africa. Uh, just quickly, Unitaid is a development financing agency and we invest in uh, bringing uh, cutting edge medicines, treatments and diagnostics to major diseases like HIV, TB, malaria, but also important co-infections that are linked to cervical cancer and, and childhood illness. Three examples from the context of COVID, I would say are these. Thanks to funding from uh, EU governments, particularly Germany, the government of France, for example, we have worked with partners such as the Drugs for Neglected Diseases um, uh, initiative to set up uh, one of the largest platform trials for COVID therapeutics in Africa in 13 countries on the continent. And not only do we hope the trial arms uh, under this platform will generate potentially novel therapeutics that will help us treat uh, outpatient uh, versions of COVID for, for mild uh, disease, 
but also build capacity for future trials um, beyond this pandemic that may be uh, necessary for pandemic preparedness and health security. So that investment, which is substantial, more than $40 million, is really key to build that capacity and work with local institutions on the continent around trials for novel therapeutics. That's one success. We don't yet have uh, trial uh, arms that have generated evidence, but we hope that uh, they will. Second important uh, example is the work that um, with funding uh, through the Act A uh, response mechanism, including from EU governments generously, Unitaid has worked in the therapeutics pillar to position several countries for the introduction of both rapid tests and novel therapeutics. Novel therapeutics uh, are novel antivirals that we hope will help us um, uh, treat vulnerable populations uh, so they don't progress to severe disease in the context of COVID. And it's because of the investments on collaboration with EU governments and others to be sure that we are able to help countries with our integrated test and treat approach. There's a lot still to be done, but we're priming the pump to be able to do that thanks to those investments. Lastly, one other accessible example is the work we've done with the uh, EU and African governments to correct the market failures in access to oxygen. Oxygen, as you know, is a critical medical therapeutic for conditions such as pneumonia, uh, such as uh, safe delivery, um, babies for pregnant women, trauma, but also now during COVID. And thanks to our work with EU funders and others, we've been able to engage with major liquid uh, and um, oxygen generation companies to reduce prices of the oxygen on the one hand, and to look at ways which we can strengthen infrastructure so that oxygen can be sustainably produced and supplied on the continent. Uh, and, and one of the key companies we're working with is Eli Key, the French company, but also two other companies, uh, you know, a German company and a US company for this type of work. So three important examples of achievements. There are many challenges, but we'll come to that. Thank you. Yes, indeed, we will come to the challenges in a minute, but it's already encouraging and inspiring to hear about the things that are going right and um, where we can and should celebrate the achievements. Thank you so much for sharing with us what Unit 8 is um, contributing in this regard. Uh, now I would like to turn over to Ethel um, from Ayavi. So the perspective of a product development partnership. Share a success story with us, please. Mm. I will answer this question drawing from the experiences of uh, Ayavi, a nonprofit research organization whose mission is to translate scientific discoveries into affordable, globally accessible public health solutions, including vaccines and antibodies for HIV, TB, COVID, emerging infectious diseases, antimicrobial resistance, and other uh, disease areas. And it's um, interesting that both Marlene and uh, uh, I think it was Yazdan who mentioned EDCTP because I have the same uh, example um, about a collaboration under the EDCTP, uh, the partnership. Uh, which in my perspective, the grants given under this partnership make an effort to promote research fairness, building of sustainable capacity for research in Africa and contextually relevant innovation. Uh, we were part, I'll, I'll particularly highlight a program that we were part of to aimed at strengthening long-term capacity for phase two and phase three clinical trials of HIV vaccines. And the findings from this study on the incidence and the prevalence of HIV in fishing communities around the Lake Victoria region uh, compared to the general populations informed the government's response to HIV and other health um, issues amongst that community. So that's one good example, Dr. Marlene, of um, research to policy and practice. The Uganda government has developed a policy framework for providing health services amongst that community. And out of the same study, there's a research consortium that was born, the Lake Victoria Consortium for Health Research. Uh, and this consortium brings together now other research groups from Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Europe, and US uh, to better understand the HIV uh, epidemic amongst the community that I mentioned, which is underserved, it's um, largely marginalized, and not only the, the, the consortium is not only looking at HIV, um, the, the HIV epidemic, but looking at research for other communicable and non-communicable diseases that affect uh, that community. And lastly, I'll just mention that we are currently uh, implementing an innovative behavioral research project uh, that should help researchers and program implementers to understand what works best 
to enhance adherence for long acting sexual and reproductive health products for adolescents, girls and young women in East Africa. So looking at the end to end approach um, understanding the communities and conducting research um, relevant to them. I think that has been a success story from the EDCTP funding. Thank you, Ethel, for reminding us of the importance of focusing on actual health needs and marginalized and underserved populations. I think this is um, a key point, and it is indeed a huge success if um, we manage to do that in some of the programs. Let me now um, ask our last uh, panelist to share a, a final success story with us. Uh, Stefan, over to you. Merci, et merci d'avoir invité Medicine for Malaria Venture à cet uh, important... Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting us to this uh, very important meeting. So, um, I'm based in Switzerland, but I'm French, so I will uh, speak in French. So as the other, other successes mentioned, I think really this collaboration with the EDCTP has been really important. So in our work, we always prioritized under desert population, marginalized population, and uh, for us, we try to develop projects impacting uh, particularly young children, pregnant women. In our work, we cooperate uh, with researchers in uh, South America, Asia, and Africa. We manage more than 65 projects. That's the widest uh, R&I portfolio. Uh, that's the widest portfolio of projects. We also belong to different consortium supported by EDCTP. We participated to Unicam 1, financed by EDCTP 1 with the teams in Guinea, Burkina Faso and Mali. The success of this cooperation was really the fact that we were able to promote and strengthen the regulations and the regulatory aspects for a malaria uh, drug. Right now, we are also cooperating with Sintofo, Pan Africa, and these other consortium are also uh, financed by EDCPT2. We're trying to focus our attention on uh, anti-malaria drugs for young children with seasonal prevention and treatment of symptoms. Those are our major successes in this uh, cooperation with the EDCTP. Thank you. Yes, and I think these are great successes. Thank you so much for sharing these with us. Um, I would like to stay with you, Stefan, actually, for the second round um, of questions, which I again channel, um, challenge all the panelists to, to keep your answers to one minute because we, are, we have already um, a lot of interesting questions coming in through the Q&A box, which I would uh, love to have the time to turn to after our third round of questions. So the second question to all of you um, would be, if you could talk about a challenge in EU-AU collaboration in global health research and innovation that you may have observed in your work, barriers to successful collaboration or barriers to better impact that in your view need to be broken down. Stefan, may I ask you first this time? Thank you very much. Very briefly, I'll come back on two challenges, uh, challenges that are pro priority for us, for MMV. First of all, the first uh, challenge is the resistance in Africa to older therapies, anti-malaria, so new treatments are required, easy uh, to take treatments and potentially with a unique dose are required to really block the transmission of these parasites and improve the situation in the global health in Africa on the long term. We are very proud of our 
new compounds of new generation that are very promising to fight against resistance. Second challenge is also to develop medicines that are respectful of uh, gender. We need to protect uh, uh, women, young women, pregnant women, and we need a new strategy to do so. And we've developed uh, here a program on um, malaria in uh, mothers in pregnancies. And I think the purpose is to promote uh, clinical trial for breastfeeding women and pregnant women to be able to develop an adapted treatment and also to create a pregnancy register so we can collect uh, quality data on anti-malarials once they've been put on the market. So the purpose still is to find appropriate and adapted treatments for pregnant women. These uh, challenges will require continuous uh, funding from the African Union and the European Union. Thank you very much. Um, but also actually already offering a solution because I know MMV is doing great work in terms of integrating um, pregnant and breastfeeding women so that we have better data and safe tools to also prevent and treat disease within these uh, populations. Ethel, uh, can I ask you to mention um, a barrier or, or a challenge? And may I just remind everybody again to keep their answers to one minute so we can turn to the questions and answers. Thank you. Yeah, there, there has been a, there are some gaps that existed even long before, but have been brought to the fore by the COVID pandemic. Um, for instance, the gap in R&D capabilities on the continent has been mentioned. And I'm looking at it in terms of uh, the spanning the whole continuum of research from discovery to access preparedness to implementation research and the, the eventual rollout of products of, of research. Um, and I'm looking at our current situation where in the face of the pandemic, the COVID-19 uh, COVID pandemic, existing epidemics that have uh, long had a major impact in Africa um, long before COVID seem to be struggling to maintain their priority in the face of the pandemic. It's good to put in resources, financial human resources into pandemic preparedness for emerging diseases, but it must not be at the expense of um, enduring epidemics, which um, I, I see um, seems to be the trend. We must keep our eyes on the target for the, those diseases that have existed since before. And uh, lastly, I'll just mention uh, stakeholder engagement, regulatory capacity, policy and legal frameworks. Those have been mentioned before. These are really important aspects of research that would enable the access of, of products that emanate from the research. And they cannot be left to project funding alone. They need to have um, their own a standalone, dedicated, focused, uh, concerted uh, support. I hope I've maintained the one minute. Brilliant. Yes, thank you so much. And also for reminding us that we cannot um, yeah, just divert attention to an, uh, the current pandemic, which is understandable, but maybe um, not the best to lose out of sight other global health challenges. And you mentioned ongoing uh, epidemics, but Stefan before also mentioned antimicrobial resistance, which I believe has been called the greatest uh, global health challenges of our times before the pandemic, and which has uh, unfortunately also yeah, lost in terms of attention. Uh, Robert, could you add any uh, challenges that you observe in, in your work? Thank you very much. Uh, and briefly, I concur with the previous two speakers uh, with the challenges they've raised, uh, completely relevant. So the, the two major challenges are raised that are linked, but, but different to add to the discourse. Uh, one is obvious and uh, goes without saying, we still don't have the financing and resources we need for um, not just the COVID response to ACTA, for uh, vaccines, for testing, uh, for treatment, for PPE but also for the major diseases, um, uh, and I will speak in the context of unitated infectious diseases, that um, we were still struggling to get on top of before this pandemic, HIV, TB, malaria, and HECO infections. So concurring what the previous speaker said, whatever we think about in terms of ramping up investment and building momentum for COVID prevention, testing, and treatment, 
can and needs to be integrated into the response to the other major diseases. And that is possible. When you think about diagnostics, you can think about integrating effective uh, testing that includes COVID, HIV, TB, HPV for cervical cancer, for example. When you think about uh, treatment, similarly, uh, the same applies. And then when you think about uh, even building capacity for local manufacturing of vaccines, end-to-end uh, -end or different components thereof, you have to remember that unless it, it is uh, accompanied by companion support for regulatory systems strengthening, we aren't really going to have the impact we need by strengthening that aspect. So the financing has to um, be multifaceted. And, um, and ultimately, when we talk about what is required against what could be lost economically, it's actually not a, a large amount. Lastly, I'll say integrated approaches to what we do. We're seeing in this response, uh, rightly, a high, big prioritization of vaccines but it can be to the exclusion of test and treat. It has to be multi-pronged and therefore a major challenge we're seeing is that uh, funding and responses for testing and treatment are lagging compared to vaccines, even though vaccines is not where it needs to be just yet. So I'll say we do need a multi-pronged end-to-end approach and that remains an important challenge um, uh, moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um... Not, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think it's also very much in line with previous uh, panelists have reminded us of. Um, I think, unfortunately, Marlene had to uh, leave us. So I would now ask uh, Yasdan to please tell us about a, a, a challenge between uh, in this area of work that you may have uh, observed in your work. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. I think uh, one of the most important challenges, which as the Malin mentioned, is sustainability. Uh, I think that we have a big issue of sustainability, which probably also comes from the way research is funded, which is based on projects every three years, every four years. And I think this doesn't match sustainability. I think that we should have top-down projects which much more sustainable funding than three or four years because the, the, there is an issue uh, when you want to put, put in place, for example, research platforms, uh, especially in the context of emerging infectious diseases where you should be ready to go. And then you have to, to each three years, to try to resubmit the project. So I think, and, and we are trying to, to uh, uh, we, we, we should really try to have uh, a mechanism to maybe for, uh, for some kind of really important top-down projects to try to have this sustainability, try to think of different mechanism of funding. Uh, 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 and to try to really build the infrastructure for this. And I think this is something that we should really try to reflect on. Over. Thanks, Lisa. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I think this is this was probably um, the, the, the harder part <laughs> of, uh, of this round of questions. Um, but the most challenging will be the last round, um, first of all, because we have to keep it super, super short. And second of all, because um, I think it's easy to identify successes because there have been many and we also see the challenges. And um, I think it's natural to the human being to, to complain, but it's harder to also think of solutions and to propose how to go forward. So may I uh, ask you in really one sentence, <laughs> one or even one word, if you can uh, think of it, just one key word, um, what could be a solution? What could be an approach, something that could help overcome some of the barriers you have mentioned in, in the previous round of questions? Really just one uh, key word to give us food for thought. I would start with Yastan this way this this round thank you thank you lisa um so 
so I, I, I think that the opportunities is that probably, of course, this pandemic, uh, the, the negative impact that it has was huge, huge. And I'm not going to come back on this because every, everyone is in aware. But I think it pointed out to some limitation in what we have been uh, implementing. And I think that it all it, it really showed us maybe on some areas how we can improve ourselves. It shows also to uh, the world the importance of implementing in sub-Saharan Africa, in Africa, uh, in important and strong infrastructures important and strong partnerships. Uh, and I think that this is extremely important for the future. And we should build from what we learn to be even more uh, 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 strong in partnership, to build even more infrastructure, and to try to actually not only build, but to build sustainable infrastructures for the future, for conducting research, because research, it was said a sister uh, of uh, global health. I'm not sure that I'm going to say a sister, but a very important component of global partnership. And also I wanted to answer very quickly a question that was asked uh, regarding uh, the whether we have a strategy in ADCTP to empower the role of African women, yes, this is a very important uh, question and just wanted to deal with that because in ADCTP, we're completely aware of that. And we are really working to try and empower African women scientists representation. Over and thanks a lot, Lisa. Thank you, Yasan, also for already answering some of the questions. This is great because then we are uh, integrating the, the audience already. Um, Robert, would you have a one sentence or even one keyword of a solution or area where we should focus more the collaboration on for us? One word is tough, so I'll make it two sentences. The first sentence is start with what you have and start now. What do I mean by that? The second sentence. All development finance agencies um, working with the EU and AU do have funded mandates, okay, for the next period. We shouldn't say that we're going to wait until the end of this pandemic or before it becomes endemic to already start applying lessons and experiences from within it to apply some of the solutions we've heard to the challenges that we have there. In our programming, even as we look at the next two to three years, let's see what we can already integrate and not simply say only when we get the additional funding that's needed, only when we have act fully financed can we do certain things. There's many things we can start to do now and then work simultaneously to crowd in and hopefully successfully bring in the resourcing that's needed to do um, the more ambitious plan uh, that is required. So start with what you have now and, uh, and, uh, and, and mainstream it into your programming already, over. Brilliant, start now. Uh, I think we can we can definitely agree with that. Ethel, would you have a, one sentence <laughs> for us? I'd like to beat Robert at that, but uh, I have more than two sentences. Uh, we need to be nimble to, uh, to in the face of the evolving global health landscape, be nimble to adjust to it as it changes. Right now, as we discuss the Africa-EU collaboration to have um, a, a strategy for vaccine development and manufacture on the continent in Africa, we could very well take advantage of this opportunity to, to have a, or develop a comprehensively uh, comprehensive, contextually relevant research agenda to enable us to tackle enduring epidemics in the face of emerging global health. This would be a framework that takes into consideration the different national and regional nuances, the priorities for the different countries, 
the context, the access context for each uh, country. Um, we need to be able to adapt the, the use of technology. For instance, as IAVI has evolved in response to emerging needs, uh, adapting what we know about HIV research into COVID research and into um, emerging um, epidemics or pandemics. We also need to have a framework that looks at the end-to-end -end approach. Uh, and as I, as I had mentioned before, um, the need to also integrate when we do have success from our research, how do those products then roll out? So an agenda that is all uh, encompassing, a comprehensive agenda, contextually relevant uh, research agenda, and we need to be nimble, we need to act fast. Okay, thank you so much, Ethel. So we have to act now and we have to act fast and we need to be nimble. Stefan, your, um, your opinion on what we can do better. I'll have two sentences, quite brief, to talk to you about opportunities. It's been mentioned in the first part of this event. It's linked to COVID-19, which showed the need to increase the need to uh, give treatment in COVID-19 vaccine. And we need to also work harder with our efforts on anti-malaria treatment. And we need to give support, technical support in Kenya, Nigeria, to companies who are working on this with South Africa as well. But we also work uh, with these countries. Thank you very much. And well done on the challenge of keeping it super to the point. I'm very happy that we can now uh, have a look at the questions from the audience. Um, unfortunately, we are running a little bit late, so we do not have a lot of time, but I really would like to address some of them. Uh, the first question is for you, Monsieur De Petri. I will uh, read it out in French just to let the interpreters know. The initiative of technology transfers, such as the half of the WHO or the FPP, cannot work without the cooperation of pharmaceutical companies. How can we facilitate their collaboration? Would you have uh, some thoughts on that for us? I'm sorry, I had a call at the same time. In all these aspects, I think what is at stake is um, long-term financing. And I think the new tools that are developed at EU level, especially the DICI, the NICI tool, can offer fundings that uh, last until 2027 uh, and can be renewed. So I think it's in the right direction to give a framework that is more perennial and structured for cooperation. I think this is very important. Um, for us, we see uh, professional training and exchanges that can happen between researchers and doctors. It is something that we really want to work on to strengthen health systems on uh, human resources. And in the introduction, it was said that it was a global aspect and it's something that we really believe in. In France, it's the global aspect of development to ensure the success of health policies food safety must be taken into account, as well as gender dimensions. And it is something that we are working on the continuum to ensure this success. We need to move forward as well on health education, health rights, a good balance uh, of men and women uh, relationships and this global approach seems very important to me to ensure the success 
that are coming in terms of research and development on global health and the creation of production units. Thank you very much. Oh, you had a call, I didn't uh, re realize. Um, and also uh, great that you mentioned the Team Europe uh, approach, because actually there's another question for uh, Mr. Högel. In 2021, the Team Europe Initiative on Manufacturing and Access to Vaccines, Medicines and Health Technologies in Africa was announced. Could you maybe say something about uh, how this initiative on manufacturing fits into EU AU cooperation on global health R and D. Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much for for the question. <clears throat> I think I think it fits very well into the uh, general policy environment between the EU and the AU. Um, there there are many policies on the AU side, on the African side, or with our, in our uh, with our African partners. That, that point to the fact that they need to do that there, there needs to needs to be done something on the capabilities of Africa to produce its own and manufacture its own uh, uh, pharmaceuticals vaccines uh, diagnostics and and whatever tools and instruments that are necessary but of course that goes hand in hand with, with many other uh, aspects like health system strengthening and so on and so forth so it's um, the Team Europe initiative uh, that is that was launched by our colleagues in TG Infra uh, last year um, is is something that is for me the start of a journey. It is not it is not uh, an initiative that when when it is finally and fully implemented will change everything. That is not possible. Um, but it is a start, and I hope that all the partners that are um, that are. Um, part of this initiative, the European Union, uh, member states in particular, um, the, the European Commission, with all its various departments, but also in particular the African Union, its member states and its commission, they need to play along. If we don't play along, if we do not co coordinate and cooperate, and if we do not have a joint vision, nothing is going to happen. We will we will waste a billion euros uh, on the on 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 trying to create manufacturing capabilities in Africa, where where there is when there is no um, no real ownership on the African side. That is very clear, and I'm sorry if I'm not very very optimistic in this regard. Um, this this um, but I think it has to be mentioned. We we cannot we cannot uh, we cannot be naive and thinking that. Uh, just because we have a good idea, uh, everything will change. This is not going to happen. We need to have more joint efforts at political level, at operational level to make this initiative um, a success. And that will require the efforts of everyone, each and every one of us, uh, including or for researchers and NGOs and so on, reaching out to the to, uh, to to the political level in the EU and in Africa, and to ensure that the that the message is heard. I just to give give you one example why I think uh, this is necessary. Think and it has already been mentioned. Think about the uh, uh, the manufacturing um, or the the the. Uh, Companies that might want to go to Africa and setting up their, their facilities there, or even African uh, uh, producers that want to in, enhance their production facilities. But how do you want to do that without having the skills uh, available on the spot? I mean, r running a, a pharmaceutical manufacturing facility is not just you know done by done like like producing producing cars. It's a whole different story. And therefore, I think uh, more joint efforts are needed, more realism, but also a clear, a clear plan and a buy-in of, of all the players that, that are uh, concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Jens. Yes, so more joint efforts, more buy-in. And the last question, unfortunately, um, is about more funding question mark last question because we are unfortunately already out of time but this question can be answered with yes and no um, from the audience asking to Yastan and also to Robert but um, please all panelists feel free to answer <laughs> with yes or no um, à propos de l'EDCTP c'est un succès mais when it comes to EDCTP is it it's a success but or uh, 
member states and EU fundings enough? F fundings are never enough. But I think that EDCTP is an extraordinary tool. I think within the framework of the third version, fundings will be even more important than before. And as I said, regarding challenges that probably we need to have funding tools that are more perennial long-term. I think it's extremely important in regards to the quantity of fundings that we have to have funding tools that are more perennial and maybe to have more fundings around the implementation of capa um, capacities and around training as well, which is extremely important. I think that research was always working on researching, but we have seen during this pandemic that doing research is part of care, of the, the actual care. So I think that health and environment and research must work all together to stop this uh, compartmentalization. And this is how we will be able to evolve. Thank you. Thank you, yes, Dan. I would just like to add that I completely agree with, with what was done. We can only thank the EDCTP uh, for the funding that they have brought in research these last few years in Africa, in malaria, in particular for MMV. And what's very important is the perennity. Uh, we have to make sure that this doesn't stop uh, abruptly and that we can continue. That is very true. Uh, um, there are so many lessons learned uh, from this session, and I'm so sorry that we cannot address all the questions. And I also haven't been able to share with you the results of the Mentimeter, um, but we will send a follow up to all the participants and share um, with you the results so that after the event, you can see from from where um, people joined us today and what their opinions were on the different aspects that we asked you in the survey. Um, and we'll try also to, to summarize all the important points made by our distinguished panelists here today. I'm cutting my closing remarks very short because we're already six minutes over and I was reminded by the production team that we have to end on time, and that is always <laughs> appreciated. Um, I would just like to thank um, Agustin Martin, my colleague at DSW, and also Eloise Well from GHA, who put a lot of work in organizing this event. Um, so thanks a lot to those two behind the scenes and also our amazing production team. Thanks so much to our panelists for joining us today and sharing your thoughts. Uh, we look forward to following up with you and um, we'll be in touch via email. Thank you so much, everybody, and have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Thank Lisa, you. all panelists. Thank you. Merci Bye. Beaucoup. Bye. À très bientôt. Au revoir. Au revoir.